Hello, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon session for day two of the Brownfield uh, Virtual Week here in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I want to thank you all for being present with us today. And we've got a very interesting discussion happening this afternoon with two colleagues from the U.S. EPA. We've got Sandra Valillo, who is an accountant with the U.S. EPA, and she is also an expert in um, compliance, she helps in particular organizations who are grant recipients comply with the grant management process and she provides coaching and training to do that. She's very, very good. And we also have Jocasta de Jesus, our friend over there on the mainland who is a Brownfields grant, uh, manager in the program and she often is uh, the person charged with managing the program grants both in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. So without further ado, we have some prepared remarks for you. Uh, so we're going to run that and then we'll come back on for question and answers. Please jot down your questions as you uh, listen to the following presentation and enjoy. We're here in the Caribbean with the Center for Creative Land Recycling. We've prepared a really wonderful presentation on brownfields for the U.S. Virgin Islands today, and I really appreciate everyone joining us. There may be a few people joining us on this call as well, um, but before we get things started, we'd actually like to hear a little bit more about, um, about you. So I'm going to begin uh, by sharing a poll and inviting you to participate in the poll. The first question on this poll is, what do you know about brownfields? Go ahead and just check your answer there. Okay, so in our first question, what do you know about brownfields? You'll be checking one on your screen. Either brownfields are new to me. I know very little. I have direct experience working with brownfields or I'm an expert on brownfields. The other question is, what are you looking forward to learning about in today's webinar? We're going to ask you to check all that apply. <clears throat> this is multiple choice. So the first option, which you're welcome to check, is I would like to know what a brownfield is and why brownfields are important to my community. The second option, which you're also welcome to check, is I hope to learn how to be strategic about brownfields development. The third option is I hope to learn about financial and technical resources and then we've also got the option, I'd like to make some new professional contacts with people who can help my community deal with brownfields. And then the last question here, have you ever applied for federal grant funding? You're going to check one, either yes or no. So we're gonna close the poll now. And uh, it looks like no one answered the poll question, so. Uh, we will. Yes, we will. I can see the I can see the results. Can you see oh. them, David? Oh, you have to share. Oh, let the me results. share the results. Here we go. All right. Okay. Jean, why don't you walk us through the results? Because I'm not seeing them on the screen. Thank you. Sure. Um, brown. Fifty-seven percent of you. So the majority said brownfields are new to you. New to you. Um, or and twenty-nine very little. So just one person said they're an expert. So lots of room. Um, for learning and so excellent that you're all here today. Uh, what are you looking forward to learning? Um, number one is I hope to learn how to be strategic about Brownfields redevelopment, but also uh, responses to the other options as well. Uh, and the last question is 71% have not applied for federal funding. So that's all very helpful information. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in that poll. Um, we are now going to begin the presentation. This is Brownfields 101. Just make sure you're at the right place. Brownfields 101, Brownfields Basics, and the Roadmap to Redevelopment. This is an interactive Zoom presentation to the U.S. Virgin Islands communities and agencies. And I'm going to present now my colleague, Jean Hammerman, We've invited her to come on and just say a few words about the Center for Creative Land Recycling. Also on our call today as presenters are Dr. Pell, 
Brown Blitz coordinator from the Division of Environmental Protection, uh, as well as Shani Mitchell, Brownfields Program Coordinator with the US EPA in Region 2. Okay, Jean, take it away. I just wanted to join you on the call today. Welcome uh, to all of you. We're very excited um, to be doing this tutorial for stakeholders in the Virgin Islands. Uh, my name is Jean Hammerman. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Creative Land Recycling. And because it's a mouthful, we say CCLR or CCLR as an abbreviation. Um, during this uh, health crisis and hurricane season, we really hope that you and your family and your communities all stay well. I'm calling in from New York City. Uh, CCLR is bi-coastal. We have staff in New York and in California. Uh, we were started 22 years ago by an organization called the Trust for Public Land. Um, the, the goal being to repurpose existing spaces. So that really uh, that has led us to champion the beneficial use of abandoned and vacant commercial and industrial properties to create jobs, increase tax revenue, and build resilience. And so you can see by repurposing existing places, we can preserve our open spaces. Uh, most importantly, uh, just uh, to say is that we are under a cooperative agreement. We work with US EPA um, for region two, which is New York, New Jersey, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico, as well as regions nine and 10, which run along the coast and it's because of their support that we can provide this program for you today. This just tells you uh, a little about the services that we provide. We train thousands of land use practitioners each year through our workshops, webinars, and thought leadership. And we bring millions of dollars into communities through EPA grant assistance and through webinars. And hopefully soon in-person meetings, we connect and convene public and private sector experts in support of brownfield impacted communities. So we hope that you'll um, get a lot out of today's uh, uh, tutorial and stay in touch with us. Thank you, David. And um, uh, we're talking about the agenda now. So the agenda for today's session is uh, working with brownfields in the U.S. Virgin Islands and the programs that exist there. What does it mean for your community? They process, uh, how do we uh, inventory, prioritize? How do we do reuse planning? How do you do community involvement? How do you find the money and the, the sources for all of this? Um, and uh, the first person to start us off today will be Dr. Pell. And take it away, Dr. Pell. Okay, thank you. Good morning, all. And as I said, my name is Dr. Clinicia Pell. I work for the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. The, that department is mission is to protect the human health and environment, and we oversee certain environmental laws. And the, we, the natural resources that we do protect are the air, the land, and the water. Our vision at the department is to make sure that everyone present on future visitors and residents have a very good quality of life and the environment that we live in is very um, nice and sustainable. We don't really um, try to contaminate it any more than we met, with, we met it. And we need to enhance our environmental qualities and our partnership with our communities, businesses, so we can spur economic development here in the territory. I work in the Division of Environmental Protection specifically, and this body is more so for environmental laws. We oversee certain um, regulatory laws such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, pesticide program, etc. We are focused on protecting and enforcement of environmental laws in our division. And we have, like I said, certain delegations for these programs here in the territory. You have, uh, our Brownsville program is basically for identifying, assessing, cleaning up and reusing properties. And we do have done in the past several several assessments. Some of them have been cleaned up and moved forward into reusable sites in the territory. And this is just a list of some of the type of properties that we worked on. As you can see, some of the properties are government owned. Some of them are semi-autonomous agencies. 
and one or two maybe private entities. What we did for this list is that we went through the entire territory, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, and listed all of the properties that were either abandoned, derelict, and then we went back and we prioritized these properties, which properties were had the infrastructure already, which properties are going to be good to be for reuse and for cleanup, and which one were very showed to be an hazard to the community they were in. And then we went ahead, got a contractor, and we did phase one assessments on that. David will talk more about what a phase one assessment entails. And this program has been going on since 2003. We started the program to assist the territory in identifying these properties, cleaning these properties up and assessing these properties. We got a grant from the federal government and that grant is, it's a Brownsville grant under the EPA and the particular grant is named the 128A, which is an assessment and initiative building program for government entities such as ourselves to assist communities, businesses to assess these properties. So we have been getting funding to do a couple of specific things. One is to get a Brownsville law in place. We have got that in place since 2008. The other was to get an inventory list together of properties that may want to be cleaned up by either the government, private entities, or community groups. And the other part was to have community engagements and let the community know what we're doing. And that's what one of this, this is what we're doing here today with this webinar. We were supposed to have a summit in May, but Due to COVID, we were forced to do uh, webinars, and this is one of the webinars that we are doing. And the last part for our 128A funding is to find ways that we can say that this property is cleaned up to environmental laws from commercial and residential use. Why we want to do this? Well, we want properties to go back into use. We want the communities to be safe. We want them to be rid of hazards. We want to have resilient housing, improve our infrastructure with climate change resistant infrastructure, especially living here in the Caribbean in the tropics. We were prone to category five hurricanes that set us back a long way and we got additional monies to work with these type of properties that were affected by the hurricane. And the, one of the, the best part of this program is job creation. There is a grant out there to assist in the job creation, not even directly for the assessment, for the cleanup, and for the redevelopment, but we also have a job training grant from the federal government that we can apply for that would help us in developing environmental jobs to work in that field. Dr. Pell, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, before we continue and I start with my portion of the presentation, I just wanted to let people know that there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen where you're more than welcome to jot some questions down as we roll through the presentation and we'll have an interchange live at the end of this PowerPoint presentation um, so we can have a little bit of inter in interaction going on as well. Um, additionally, uh, we are going to be able to share the list of registrants uh, to this presentation. You're going to be receiving at the end of this uh, presentation an email from me with the link to um, a review of our performance today, as well as the PowerPoint screens themselves and um, additional information. If you are interested in receiving that list of registrants, just send me a note and I will be more than glad to send it out to you. So what is a brownfield? <clears throat> brownfields uh, can be abandoned, but they might not be brownfields. So let's look at that. So um, abandoned properties can be vacant, deteriorating. They can be properties that um, uh, are, have back taxes or they could be up to date. But a brownfield has this additional complication of the suspicion of contamination. And they can be an opportunity that helps you and your community and your uh, jurisdiction address deteriorating properties that might be in your communities through the Brownfields program. We'll talk a bit more about that. So there's also a thing called Superfund. People have heard about this Superfund. Superfund is really about the worst of the cases, really hazardous and industrial sites that are so bad 
that the owner of those properties probably isn't viable financially enough to handle and tackle the level of contamination that's on those sites. And in addition, they become priority with the US EPA because they are really a threat to human environmental health and an urgent threat. Brownfields, again, represent an economic opportunity, but the threat of environmental contamination and human dangers is a bit less than a Superfund site. Continuing, here's the legal definition. These are real properties, so physical real estate, the expansion or redevelopment or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Again, there are opportunities for funding and can be aligned to your redevelopment goals for your communities. Um, And these are including all kinds of sites. I typically, uh, in the Caribbean, give people the example, that old gas station that's sitting on the corner, that's been there, locked up for ages. That's a good example of a brownfield, typically. Could be a dry cleaner or an old mechanical repair shop that's since shuttered and it's just sat there for use. That's a good example of a brownfield. This is kind of what they look like. We've got a couple examples here from Puerto Rico and some examples from the islands uh, there in the USVI. And why are these problems? Because of the screen. They uh, can increase criminal activity in your neighborhoods. They can create an economic downward spiral that it discourages investment and actually uh, creates a loss of the value for those properties. That downward spiral can continue and it can can increase the amount of unemployment. And, uh, you know, it makes people's quality of life diminish, and it can also create stagnation in your local economies. So why do we want to do this? Why do we want to work on brownfields? There are really four great points of benefit to doing it. You can improve your economic and your tax base for your municipalities. You can encourage economic investment into these properties. You're going to be dealing with some environmental hazards, as well as improving people's quality of life. From the redevelopment perspective for developers, it's also important for us to recognize and try to address the uncertainties and costs. So if I'm a developer and I see a brownfield, the first thing probably I'm gonna think about is the cleanup cost and the liability. Does it surpass the actual market value of this property or say that property would be upside down? That's kind of a no starter for many developers. And the implication is that it's gonna require some public investment or a change in the market to um, make that property more attractive for investments. And then it could be that the margin is also so tiny for the developer that they're also not interested in doing all that work only to have a little bit of profit. So again, targeted public investment can really work to make these properties more feasible. And then if we look at the trajectory of the Brownfields redevelopment, you can see in the column on the left, pre-development, this is really where a lot of EPAs funding and programs are really focused on. They're helping us with doing reuse planning, doing environmental evaluation, doing remedial action and cleanup plans, and actually doing remediation. But it's important to recognize that EPA monies, unless the demolition is required to deal with a contaminant, typically EPA money doesn't cover demolition, nor does EPA provide tax incentives or rezoning help. So these are other areas where public and private investment can come out uh, and and help. But really, in this pre-development phase, people aren't typically too eager to spend money on things that are pre-development. So we're helping communities through the Brownfields program really prepare these properties for investment and redevelopment and also creating a great vision with community. And we take leadership very, very seriously because these are complex initiatives and they do take a lot of time and they do take perseverance and commitment. And you need more than one person to make it happen. You really need some excellent partners that can also leverage or bring along with them the resources and the technical support that can exercise the really long range visions and the plans for implementation that you develop with your communities. In the Brownfields redevelopment process, We're gonna be walking you through various parts of this process, starting with how do I select these brownfield sites and identify them and work with my community and get my community involved. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about access and acquisition, the remediation thing, the site preparation, and then the redevelopment. The key here is to recognize that to walk you through all of these steps is going to take 
a bit of time and you need to be very, very strategic about what you're going to do, who you're going to bring on board to help you, and what is your particular role going to be. So you fill your circle with the talent you need to be able to execute and get these beautiful visions that you'll set with communities uh, realized. So how do we identify these properties? There's this thing called the Brownfields Inventory. And basically what we're doing is we're making a list of potential properties, and then we're looking at data about them. We can talk to our neighbors, we can talk to community members who are going to have some sense of where these properties are in their midst. Government employees can also assist with that, as can local nonprofits and environmental organizations. The site identification itself, you don't need so much detail to be able to fill out your inventory. You're going to need a physical address. Typically, that's the number of the building and a street or a kilometer marker and the street. If you know who the present owner is, that's fantastic. You want to speak to your neighbors of that site to find out what they know about past and current uses that may have provoked contamination there. And then you're going to identify with your municipality and your community members sort of a projected future. Once the site can be addressed, what do we want to see on this site? Then the additional characteristics information that you might want to collect include the size, the environmental status, when it was built, and the tax status. Identifying these sites also includes setting criteria and priorities with your communities. Our communities are probably among our biggest help with these projects because they have so much information and they really are the people who are directly impacted by having these properties in their midst. So what's important is to set these priorities uh, with the community, assuming of course that it's not an immediate public health emergency. So we want to know what the community thinks is important. We want to include things like beautification projects even. It doesn't have to be a building there, it could be a park. Um, something that really benefits the community. And then you can also create these prioritization characteristics and add weight to them, and then determine a priority in this manner. Here's an example of that, a prioritization matrix. On the left, in the blue, you can see the different kinds of sites that are listed here in the inventory. And then the columns immediately to the right have numbers in them. These are the weighted averages that determine if you're, you're weighting each of these things. So is it a hazard? Is it a development potential? Is there some blight reduction? Do we know who the owner is? And you come up with a score. And then the site location information is further there on the right-hand columns. So setting a plan and setting a vision with your community. These are really exciting opportunities to get your communities together and sit down and, and talk with them about what they need, what they're looking for, for a future vision, and come together and create some design scenarios. We typically do this in kind of a charrette setting, but that's not limited to that. But basically, you're involving the community, and in doing so, you're helping your community gather leverage or, or get excited about a project and get a, a project or a potential reuse vision so exciting for them that they actually help want to help you champion it and get it done. Um, it helps uh, elected officials understand and businesses understand what are the community's interests. And if you've got community involvement ahead of time, a developer who's coming in works is probably going to like that because it's going to indicate to them that it reduces the amount of risk that they may have, such as uh, potentials for delays, lawsuits, or negative press about projects that just the community isn't interested in or, or wouldn't like to see in the first place. And then this is a compliance thing with... Uh, EPA funding federal requirements. So if you get your community involved, you're helping also meet requirements for EPA's funding of these projects. Who do you want to get involved in these sessions then? Obviously, you want to have your elected officials involved. You want to get your interested residents and citizens involved, nonprofit groups, neighborhood groups, community development corporations, businesses, any financial or economic development institutions that may be in your community or your jurisdiction. And then how do you get these people together? Well, you really wanna take three steps to increase their participation in the planning process. You wanna inform them using traditional methods like flyers, news articles, social media. You can have a website where you publish notes and decisions that are made. 
Uh, you can solicit input through surveys, on the phone, by mail, online. And there's even an application that's on phones now called Poll Everywhere, which is a beautiful tool, especially in these times of COVID-19, where you could host a meeting like this and talk with your community and then put up a poll where people could interact on their phone and you'll know what they think about the plans that um, you guys are laying out. The key is that these are participatory processes where you might have public meetings, you might have charrettes, you may have visioning sessions, you might do tours, you could even get people out on bicycles. We've done bicycle tours and even kayak tours. So you can get a, a point of view from the sea of what brownfields look like from the sea in your communities. You might wanna present some scenarios. These are a couple of scenarios for projects that we were re-envisioning here in, in Ponce, Puerto Rico, the town that I live in here in the Caribbean. So this is one scenario where basically we're talking about a phase development for a site and the architects who worked on this with us, they presented you know, a phase one close to the street. So build that out first and then a phase two take on some of the larger development, a phase three, some of the smaller development, then finish it off with a phase four. Or you could present a completely different kind of reuse scenario where it's basically knocking it all down and starting over in what people like to call a clean slate. So once you've got your property planned and your inventory created, and assuming you've got some funds to get things done, you would then begin to do something called environmental due diligence, or in essence, you're doing an assessment of these sites to determine actually if they are contaminated, if the, the suspicion is justified. And there are two kinds of studies that are done there. We'll talk about those. They're called phase one environmental site assessment and phase two environmental site assessment. Then we're going to walk into the ideas about cleanup and how we can do cleanup of these sites and how we can prioritize those cleanup actions and then the implementation component. All of these steps, you really want to try to mitigate your risk as much as you can. So the key for starting this process when you begin to work with the brownfields after you've got your list is perform this due diligence. You're going to do something that EPA calls all appropriate inquiries. You're going to require the assistance of a trusted consultant who has the necessary certifications and training as an engineer, typically. This consultant or consulting company is going to help your group put together what's called a phase one environmental site assessment, which basically the end game here is that you're going to have a document that's reliable and provides confidence to you as a potential buyer or person who's acquiring this site, gonna give you a qualified opinion of the likelihood of the contamination. And they do this by looking at records of uh, past use, identifying hazards, interviewing the owners and operators, they get out to the site and they scan the site, they look at what's happened on this site, what they can see with their eyes. <clears throat> they may do some preliminary visual inspection for mold, radon asbestos, lead-based paint, or other hazardous and they're going to try to identify ecological, archeological, or historic factors that may complicate this development. Assuming that the opinion from the phase one is that there's probably contamination there, then your project would go to a phase two environmental assessment in which actual testing and access to the site is required to be able to test things like soil, groundwater, and building materials. And those are all sent to a lab, and then they're compared to state and federal regulations. And you begin to form a picture of what it's gonna to take to clean up your sites. There are many cases though, where the phase one environmental site assessment, the, the environmental professional will come back to you and say, look, we didn't really find anything that demonstrates this property has any environmental thing, things to worry about. You've done your due diligence, so you can acquire that site within six months, of the date of that phase one environmental site assessment and protect yourself from environmental liability under federal law. This is a real plus. The next step, <clears throat> having completed this, is you're gonna be planning for your environmental remediation. And really, you can see here, you can have results or you can have excuses, but not both. And this is really speaking to the idea 
that your cleanup plans have to be tied to obviously the results of your assessments, but also where you want to take this property in the future. And then if you can integrate green cleanup strategies and lower cost cleanup strategies, you should definitely make that known and make sure that that's implemented and defined in part of your planning process. So how do you get these things cleaned up and built out? You actually start to stack different kinds of funds and different kinds of technical assistance. So USBI has got funds through its 128A, as Dr. Pell spoke about. There are some local tools there in the USBI, including tax increment finance. You are part of an opportunity zone there in the USBI, another kind of tax incentive. There are resources with the Council of Development Finance agencies that can assist you. And then there are people like CClear that provide technical assistance to brownfields under an agreement with the US EPA. And we do that work free of charge. Then you want to talk about, well, how we're going to attract these investors. <clears throat> the investors you attract by working in collaboration with your economic development people. So these are part of your team that you've brought all along the way. So you're going to want a marketing sheet that talks about the real estate asset. You're going to talk about the investment that you've made, getting the site assessed and perhaps cleaned up. You're going to talk about the local conditions in your economic market and the value of this real estate for that. You can share with the potential developers the reuse and envision that the community has come up with, as well as how zoning may or may not have changed to compensate and adopt for that vision. You can be very transparent. Actually, it's ideal if you can be very transparent with your potential developer about how processes are approved in the USVI, as well as timelines and requirements being very transparent at the top. So the potential developer can assess, you know, the amount of time and the amount of money it's going to take to be able to successfully execute this project. I'm going to turn this over now to Shanine, who we will ask to come off mute, and I will mute myself. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pell. <laughs> so first, uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Shanine. I am the Brownfields Program Coordinator for Region 2. And I know you heard a lot of information, so I'm going to talk to you real quickly about our grant program. We're starting off with the assessment grants. They're our most common grant. It is designed to inventory, characterize, and assess brownfield sites. It involves community engagement and involvement which are also part of the project. Uh, the assessment grants help to determine the type of investigation that is needed, the contaminants, of course, and the potential cleanup options. And I know that David mentioned some of that in his presentation. Next, we have the RLF grants or the Revolving Loan Fund grants, and they are designed to provide loans and subgrants to eligible entities for cleanup. The funds are made from loans and are returned to the grant program to be borrowed again. Next, we have the cleanup grants. Uh, they're designed for eligible cleanup activities. Community engagement and involvement are also part of the project. And then we have our multipurpose grants. They're a combination of assessment and cleanup activities and can take place on one or more on multiple sites. And then finally, we have our Brownfields Job Training or the Environmental Workforce Development and Job Training Grant. I know that's a mouthful, but it provides eligible entities with funds to recruit, train, and place unemployed under, and underemployed residents in environmental jobs. So all of these grants are competed nationally. The next cycle of assessment, cleanup, and multipurpose grants are expected to be released in late August, early September, the RLF will be offered next year. The job training grants are expected to be released next week. So we are working on providing information on how to apply and a review of the guidelines will be offered by CCLAIR, EPA headquarters, and the regional office. So reach out to us at any time for more information. So I talked a little bit about the grants, so now I want to turn your attention to the State and Tribal Response Program. It's also called the Section 120A, based on that section of the CERCLA law. It's designed to help environmental response programs. Funding can be used for limited site assessment and cleanups. Funding is requested every year for this program and is led by Dr. Pell through the Department of 
planning and natural resources, as she mentioned earlier. So thank you, Dr. Pell. So now I want to talk a little bit about technical assistance. With CCLAIR as our tab provider for Region 2, they organize webinars like this one. So thank you to David, Jean, and the CCLAIR team for such hard work. The last topic that I wanted to cover today is the Targeted Brownfields Assessment Program. TBAs help eligible entities to assess their brownfield sites. TBAs are conducted by an EPA contractor on behalf of the community. It is free of charge and saves the community time and money. The program is non-competitive and requests are accepted on a rolling basis. We recommend that sites have a redevelopment goal or vision. You can work with CCLAIR and our EPA TBA coordinator to submit sites to the program. So as you can see, there are several activities that can be conducted under the targeted brownfield assessment, including a phase one and phase two. And we also, the program also helps to assist with finding out the types of contaminants on the sites, of course, but the type of investigations that are needed and the potential cleanup options. So I believe that was it. I want to thank everyone for their time today. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our EPA program office or CCLAIR. Janine, thank you very much. I am going to talk before we open it up to questions about some upcoming activities that we've gotten some resources that are available also, as well as remind you all who are on the line that we're going to be sending out about one o'clock today an email with the slides from this presentation, as well as links to where you can register for this really interesting webinar that's happening on the July 9th that we're offering for both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands with experts in finance development. You can register by following that link there or looking at the email that you'll receive at one o'clock with the information on that. And now we're going to open it up for questions. So you are all welcome to unmute yourself and uh, I'm going to end this presentation and we can have a nice little discussion because we've got some time left uh, to do just that. So let me stop this presentation. We're back. Hello. Yes. Yes. Well, Hello. Uh, that was a really uh, great presentation. It's been a while since I've seen that, and uh, I'm excited to uh, be able to share it with our audience today. So um, there's quite a bit of noise on the line, so I'm going to ask yourselves to mute if you are not speaking at the moment. Uh, it's a little distracting for our audience. It's hard for me to concentrate. Thank you. Um, there is um, something, a theme that I think was raised in the presentation that we rarely touch upon, but I know our communities and our municipalities, in particular those that are impacted by earthquakes and that have historic and hurricanes and that have historic properties are going to be interested in, as well as um, properties that may have uh, threatened species. And so I'm wondering if um, Sandra or Jocasta might be able to speak to the grant management aspect of managing brownfield sites that are historic properties or that may have threatened or endangered species. Well, so we're talking about the, the, yes. the, the National yes. Historic Preservation Act as well as the Endangered Species Act and how that may apply in both cases. Well, David, I haven't had the chance to um, work with any of my projects that have those, you know, historical uh, preservations property of any endangered species. So I have not encountered um, any of those situations with any of my grants. Certainly I understand that um, mm -hmm. if, if you are working on a property that is historic, that you are yeah. required under the grant and com to comply with the grant, to do the consultation with the uh, State Historic Preservation Office. And yes. that, that, that should also be included in the um, requirements uh, with, your con with your consultants, uh, if you are using consultants to manage that aspect of the grant. So I think it's worth mentioning because so many of yes. the properties in the VI as well as in Puerto Rico have been impacted recently. Uh, even more so by regular weather, but by hurricanes and earthquakes, uh, that these uh, pieces are important. And in addition, I know that at least in one case in the U.S. Virgin Islands, we're working with a, cl a client there that has an endangered species on one of the brownfield sites that they want to see redeveloped into a park. Uh, and so they're going to have to make that consultation appropriately 
uh, related to protection of this endangered species. And in this case, it is a, an endangered tree boa, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. So I mean, if any of, yes, if any of the organizations that are here uh, will have such a, such a um, project, they could definitely reach out to us and we'll give them the proper instructions on what they need to follow in that case. Great, fantastic. Yes. So um, I want to let people know that you have the opportunity to interact with us be, uh, behind a chat. So if you look above um, this screen, you will see a button that says engage. You're going to want to touch that button that says engage. And then there's another button right underneath it that says Q&A. That's the place where you can enter any kind of questions that you have as you listen to the presentation or as you continue to hear our discussion right now. And uh, those questions will be passed to us and we'll be able to ask them live on camera. And I can see we've got one right now. Somebody wanted to know about um, tips about how to get the community involved in their projects. Uh, when, well, from my experience, I will say that it it is critical to have the community involved from day one. And when I mean day one is right when you start thinking about applying for funding, it's important that they know from the start that this type of funding, you will be um, applying for the benefits that those fundings will have for the community and the type of projects that they're going to be working on. Um, if you guys have any type of community events or community meetings that you regularly have with the residents, it's good to let them know right at the beginning. Um, also, in both each, each of the residents, right from uh from the beginning especially in all the stages of the of the of the grant especially when you are working on your inventory make sure that all the properties that you include there uh you have the approval uh, from the community or you get their input on what type of property um will be included in that in that inventory also, when you talk about end use or any type of redevelopment plans, it's important to involve the community and get their feedback. They have to be involved in, in every activity. You have to make them feel that their voice counts and their suggestions will be considered. I can tell you from my experience, I live in New Jersey and right uh like a few blocks from my from my house there was a little convenience store that was closed down and then the owner was proposing of doing a multi-family building where they're gonna have like i think it was four or five stories for rental and then they invited all the residents from from this town to to participate in a meeting to discuss that a specific project and all the residents opposed to that. Um, and one of the reasons was because parking in this area is very limited. And then having this type of development, it would just make the situation worse. And sometimes they don't think about these things and uh, how important is the community and their input. And I can tell you, you can guess what happened to that project. It went nowhere. So that's why it's important to have the support of the community from day one. And in New Jersey, that's actually required probably as part of the permitting. Process. Yes, as part of any redevelopment, you have to get the community involved and get their input. Yes. Right. So it's not always the case in other jurisdictions that that kind of consultation process happens. But I know that working with the US EPA, because of the environmental justice component of many mm -hmm. of the, the programs um, that, that you all run, um, that yes. is a community consultation and making it very transparent as well as a real participatory process rather than, okay, we heard you, we checked that box. Yes. Which can happen as well, as we yeah. know. Um, mm -hmm. it really, it helps your project really fly if you have community buy-in. So for the grant, you are required to get your community involved. Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jocasta. So um, we have a question here about um, selecting properties for the inventory. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we did we did a project here um, in uh, three municipalities on the coast, 
where we did community consultation as part of the yes. selection of properties because we wanted uh -huh. to know which, which sites in the communities were the most problematic. And then we also spoke with the, the mayor, which had a, a good, or the mayors, which had a good list of um, public nuisance sites uh, that they had already developed. And from there, we developed a very extensive list and su started submitting mm -hmm. um, eligibility requests. What other kinds of ways have you seen that communities or projects uh, use to uh, select a, a properties for inventory? Yes, like you said, always have the community involved on the type of properties that you're going to be including. And also having a rating of all the properties that are going to be included will help tremendously. For example, you can rate them based on the potential they have for redevelopment or based on the priority that these properties have for the community. It's always good to have, to create a database search for this property, include pictures, addresses, if the organization is not the owner, in information about who owns the property. And um, it will make your project a lot easier when you start selecting uh, properties because all you have to do is go into that database and then um, based on the rating, start picking, picking out properties. And like you said, having the community involved in the selection of, of those properties is critical. You know, absolutely. And and you mentioned, you know, knowing who the owners are as well. Oftentimes um, the cities won't know the owners, but the neighbors will. And so, yes. you know, we would go out with a hard hat and, uh, you know, a clipboard. So we look official uh, and we yes. start, you know, writing things down and looking around and then people will come out and they'll say, what are you doing? And we'll, we'll, we'll explain what we're doing. And then that way we can have engagement and you know we show our identification of course but um, it's a way of breaking down that barrier and um, getting the community also inside excited while you're there on the street you yes. know looking at a, a site you know uh, watching it at least from the from the exterior to, to evaluate it as a possible um, inventory prospect so um that's uh, definitely the community helps a lot, uh, for sure. yes definitely um, so you know, because of COVID, I know that um, many of the project and the hurricanes, um, some of the projects have had to be extended over time. Um, yes. Because they, there were these barriers and the federal government recognized, you know, this particular kind of situ situations. But mm -hmm. um, in other kind of circumstances, there may not be a disaster involved, but then a, a city that's working their grant or a community that's working their grant may not um, have enough time to complete their grant. What um, do you advise to them as they're managing their grant, if they're kind mm -hmm. of getting the sense that things are slipping and they're, they're, they need more time? Yes, well, they can always request an extension of the grant, we call this a NOTA cost extension. Uh, for assessment and for cleanups, the performance is uh, for three years. So if you think those three years were not enough, you can come in and request uh, that, that extension. It could be um, whatever time you think you need, all the grants have a seven year period of performance. So you can extend it up to seven years for multi-purpose and for the revolving loan fund, it is a five year period. But if you need to go a little bit beyond that, request an extension. It's, but it is always, it's important that you have a justification of why you need that extension. What might a justification uh, that is acceptable for you look like? Yeah, it could be that they have personal changes in their in their office that always happen. Um, they could be any type of delays. Let's say they couldn't get any access to a property, so they have to substitute the property, start the whole process all over again. Those are some of the common um, ways that they can, you know, delay the project and they will need an extension. So it sounds like the agency is is quite reasonable in um, in in honoring or considering those requests. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm looking at the, ch uh, the chat here and uh, we've got a great question here from the chat. Um, um, they're sharing uh, great information. Thanks. Shanine mentioned the two phases of assessment. Is there a post assessment after revitalization to ensure that air, land and water are, are still of good quality? Yes. 
Is that a, a comment from Shani or a question from Shani? This is a question from our audience. Okay, uh, I'm and, sorry. Uh, and they're just commenting on Shanine's part of the presentation. So they're wondering, this person is wondering in particular, you know, after phase one and phase two, then uh -huh. you go into redevelopment. Are there any yes. kind of post assessments that um, people should be aware of um, after revitalization has occurred to ensure that there's still integrity in the air, land, and water around these properties? Um, well, after you do the assessment, the phase one, the phase two, then you will move on to the cleanup of the property or the whole remediation. And after that, property is being cleaned up, then uh, do you mean if it involves a body of water on the property? Um, I, I don't know. I don't have more information from the okay. question. But I can see that they're particularly concerned, you know, what well, we've cleaned up the site, mm -hmm. but um, are we're, we're, are we going to look for impacts around that site after it's been cleaned up and redeveloped? Or is that not necessary? Well, if it's necessary, it depends because, you know, all the projects are different. If it's, if it's required any type of um, that type of assessment after it's been cleaned up or any type of follow up, sure, that does. That's allowable. Um, they can get in contact with us. Um, any issues they might see, um, we can definitely uh, follow up after the cleanup. Well, I can think of one example, just off the top of my head, where sometimes mm -hmm. cleanup involves in situ, in situ um, cleanup. So for instance, you might have a, a large parcel that has a particular area where the developers decide not to redevelop part of that site and leave okay. it leave it encapsulated, if you will, and sort of okay. have passive use, like a, a little park where there are no human exposures. So in that kind of circumstance, you know, maybe there is ongoing um, uh, reference checks done periodically? Yes, sure, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and then for, for sure um, in the Guayania area where there are, you know, uh, environmental um, plumes in the groundwater, Kind of moving mm -hmm. around under some of those sites, I would imagine that in some some cases, a brownfield might actually have a, a well on site where continued monitoring of um, expo yeah. uh, exposures of, of contamination might take yeah. place. Yeah, and also in that case, we can refer them to to our water division, and they for sure can do a lot of the follow ups that is not done under the the program that we have to assess the property. If there's any program that needs to be involved to do any type of follow-up, yeah, we'll get them, we, we'll get that in, the, them involved. Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. question. And because we haven't seen a lot of cleanups occur yet here in Puerto Rico, I can't say about the BI, um, with um, EPA funds, um, it's, it's difficult for us to say, but I guess I'm referring to my experience and looking at other jurisdictions where they've had in situ um, kind of cleanups take place. There's a okay. follow-up question here. Mm -hmm. um, um, the person writes, yes, I'm thinking about ensuring quality, especially if we want, for example, to welcome endangered species back onto their historic lands. Okay. So thank you for that qual Thank you for uh, that clarification there in the audience. And then we've got quite a question here from Louise. It says, please dive into a bit more about the difference in the dynamics when dealing with residential versus industrial properties. Well, uh, from a historical part, part of um, historical view, you know, uh, industrial property will have a lot more contamination than an, a residential that's been abandoned. We're probably going to see there some type of asbestos um, contamination. But when it comes to industrial property, there's a lot of kinds of um, more, it, it will be, well, um, the contamination will be higher than if we, you know, are addressing a, a residential. That's that's the only thing that I can see a difference. But also, I think that um, it depends on the kind of reuse that um, that the city or oh, the developers are projecting, right? Yes, I'm. Yeah, I think that was yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, it will depend on the end use of the property. If it was uh, industrial property, then it will. It require more cleanup depending on the end use uh, for that property for sure. Yeah, I think the strictest um, um, strictest cleanup standards 
are for properties yes. that are used for residential purposes and or schools or daycares that yes. require yes. a more strict level of cleanup. And frankly, many properties we've seen that are industrial are stay as industrial classifications and that that doesn't change. So then the cleanup would not ever probably get to the residential level of cleanup on industrial site because the reuse would never be residential. Yes, yes, yes. Sure. These are great questions, guys. Keep them yes, coming in. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we have a question here. Um, if our staff doesn't have the experience uh, to manage a grant, can they hire someone to do that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Just the same way that they hire a contractor to do the assessment part of the grant, they can hire a consultant uh, to then uh, manage the grant and prepare all the required report that are necessary uh, to compliance with, with, the, with the grant. Yes, that's allowable. So Sandra, could you walk us through um, the requirement, the federal requirement related to procurement in terms of managing the grant? Because I think people are sometimes unclear of that. And I know that organizations that are new to managing federal grants may not quite understand those requirements about procurement. Right. Um... Yes, generally, you know, um, to be sure and be in compliance, you know, with federal grants, um, as a start, I will say as a tip for compliance is the recipient, uh, uh, when you start working with your grants uh, on the outlined uh, activities, you have to adhere, adhere to your, uh, to the grant regulations, uh, the part 200, uh, get you know acquainted with those and always adhere with your terms and conditions outline it in your grant agreement you should regularly review the terms and conditions throughout the duration of the projects to ensure compliance with all the requirements in the regulations you know there are sections that talks about the procurement processes you know to be followed and to be in compliance with the regulations for states, normally, you know, they have their own set of rules which can be followed for non-profit or the other recipients. You know, they, they need to develop those that mirrors the, our regulations. Um, so, in generally, you know, it's it's basically it's a it's a lot to talk about compliance. Um, I have uh, a you know uh, my role in 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 the agencies basically. It's a six um, a, the grantees in the geo, geo, a, graphical areas of Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, and this is including state municipalities. Uh, so I develop a training plan and I provide a technical sessions one on one uh, to help you understand the applicable grant and financial management requirements. Uh, Back to so, the procurement question. Sorry to interrupt there, uh, Sandra. Back to the procurement requirement. Um, uh -huh. Where do you see uh, in the grant management process that most people make an error in that? Because m many times these errors are something that's easy to, to fix, uh -huh. but people sometimes aren't aware. And that's no defense, not being aware, obviously. Right. I think the, the basis of that, you have to follow your own procedures. You have to have a standard of operating procedures that establish the set of rules for, for, procurement, for procurement in your organization. So one of the things that happen normally is that people don't follow those, right? Once they're established, and their the, the organization makes sure that they're in compliance with the regulation, people have to follow them. You know, as an example, I will say, you know, if you are in the contracting process and your regulations or, you know, your set of rules says that you have to do one, two, or three, you have to follow, you know, you, you need to seek for corporations, um, make sure that you select the proper candidate based on your set of, you know, rules. Um, and, not only in the contracting process, you know, for procuring, you know, services or contracts, also when uh, you need to have a, a financial management system. And when I say system is, you know, the computer, you know, the system itself and the sort of rule, which basically establish that you need to, you know, follow internal procedures, you know, um, internal controls. Um, by having internal controls, you need to ensure that you have the right documentation that back up the costs that you incur in your grant. So 
I'm trying, you know, basically to give you like a general idea, a high level. Oh, it's great. It's very helpful because it's people need to be, it's a lot. And we're so pleased that you're there to offer that kind of guidance to people um, mm -hmm. because um, people generally want to do well when they manage these grants. Right. And there's That's definitely, I guess the key point here is that there's a, there's staff available, not to penalize mm -hmm. you, but to take your hand and walk you through that process so you can confidently know that you're going to comply with the regulations for the grant. Sandra, there's another question here in the chat, just one, mm -hmm. this one's for you. Um, mm -hmm. They're wondering if there are any kind of trainings or certifications that are required to be managing these grants. Right, uh, basically uh, to be eligible, you know, to receive grants, you need to be in compliance. You have to have a, a sound management system but of course, you know, we have trainings, you know, uh, you can go to the OGDB, OG, the Office of Grant of Department um, site that offer training and it will help you, you know, to understand how a, a grant should be managed. Uh, there's no like a certification program, you know, within our agency uh, because we basically, the basis is that you are eligible and you are in compliance. But, uh, but at the same time, we help, you know, grantees and we coach grantees, you know, to, to, to you know, help them in the compliance um, process. So um, there's no such certification, as I said. However, you know, we have, you know, training, you know, webinars on, on the OG uh, Office of Grant Manage, uh, Grants Department um, site for grantees and also in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm the one, I have the role basically to provide those trainings uh, for the Caribbean and Puerto Rico and, and I can help you, you know, my Jocasta uh, or you, you can provide my contact information. I'm more than happy, you know, to assist any grantee, you know, in the Caribbean. Fantastic. You know, and also um, there's a question here about C Claire and uh, or the Center for Creative Land Recycling where um, I'm, I'm a senior advisor mm -hmm. and the presenters of this conference. Do we offer technical assistance to the U.S. Virgin Islands? Absolutely we do. Um, we mm -hmm. have a team of three people here based in the Caribbean. We're based in Puerto Rico, but certainly we can set up direct one-on-one -on -one consultations or provide specified and specific training for your group or your organization if you would like that. And it's just a matter of touching our door, knocking on our door. There's no wrong door to knock on. We're happy to help you in any way that we can. And if we don't have the answers, we have a very broad network and we can get those answers for you and bring the experts that you need. Um, we've got a question here um, from the chat again. Um, there's an mm -hmm. RFP, uh, let's see here. RFPs request detailed information on proposed uses for potential brownfield sites. But when we don't know what sites are brownfields, how do we balance that? Well, RFP, you mean after they receive the fund, they have to prepare an RFP to hire the contractor to so come and do the assessment work. I think this is coming from a contractor who's looking at an RFP and is not okay. seeing any specialized uses for brownfields defined in that RFP. And so they don't know what brownfield sites they're going to be working on. How can they sort of balance, balance that when they're responding? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a draft of an RFP that we can provide, uh, but in, on the RFP, there's not necessarily have to mention the list of the property that they're going to be doing. It's only the work that's going to be completed on those sites. After you prepare your RFP, you have your contractor on board, and then you start then your inventory and sending us the form that we need to approve those properties. And then it's when the contractor is going to move forward and do the works on those properties that have already been approved by us before they start any work. So those properties have to be approved by us before they start uh, working on them. That's a very important point that you yes. mentioned, Joe Pasta, because we've seen um, in our consulting work cases where the contractor is eager to get going, and that's you know rightly so, but they're working on sites that haven't passed that eligibility determination. No, that's um, and the that's city doesn't true. necessarily inform them that that's required. So yeah. contractors, you can protect yourself by asking, well, has this site been approved by exactly. EPA's eligibility determination? Exactly. Um, and, and you save yourself a lot of heartache afterwards by having asked that simple question. Yes. Uh, we have a question here from uh, our friend Terry, 
He's wondering at what stage of the site's proposed site revitalization should an mm -hmm. EPA Brownfields grant recipient explore other funding resources, for example, other federal grant programs, state economic development and private entities, or to increase the chance for that project to be successful. Um, the presentation actually touched on that point a little bit, that yes. as you're going into thinking about the long game of redeveloping your site, it's important that we recognize that EPA grants will get you so far, but get yes. you basically to your pre-development um, work, uh, which is often the most difficult part of a project to fund, because some places look at it as high risk funding, and that's why the EPA is involved in, in that early phase development work to help cities get those sites ready to go. So um, I think um, you would agree, uh, you can add your thoughts, obviously, yeah. that you want to do it early on. So you want to think about the long game of that redevelopment and look yes. at other resources. So EPA and CCLEAR have developed a resource guide to the U.S. Virgin Islands and also to Puerto Rico that lists a lot of those resources that are available. Mm -hmm. um, as well, I want to invite everyone who's listening right now to join us this Friday at noon for the interagency working group where we're going to be bringing together 10 different agencies speaking mm -hmm. directly to a project. Um, you're going to hear those agencies respond to the breadth of uh, funding needs that uh, one particular project might have. So it'll be an interesting exercise for people to, in the audience, witness that. Witness yeah, that and, and David, going back to, to the question, as soon as you have the assessment completed on a property and you develop an end use plan, you can start then thinking about as soon, as soon as you have the community also approval on what the end use is going to be for that property that you're trying to redevelop, then you can start and then looking uh, for all the type of fundings that are going to uh, be applicable to that type of, of development. And we have actually developed a booklet that we have right now available in our booth uh, where it tells you um, right from the beginning of starting you know your brownfields project right to that part when it comes to redevelop and we included links to other organizations that offer funding for redevelopment and you can download that book right now from our booth fantastic that's excellent yes. and that actually addresses one of the following questions that okay has asked, so that's great um somebody's asking here um kevin where they can find um the list of brownfield sites already identified so i know that there is online through the u.s epa's website um brownfields in my community yes would clean up cleanups in my community there's a site it's called cleanups in my community it has information from the United States, complete United States, even Puerto Rico, you can go into that uh, site, type of an address or a zip code or a city, and then you can see, it's gonna show you a little map where all the um, brownfields probably that have been identified will be included there. Excellent. And I know in Puerto Rico through um, the Department of Natural Resources, um, I forgot what it's called now, the new name for that state agency. Um, but they also have a brownfields listings of the brownfields inventories that have been created across the island that's available online. And I think that the U.S. Virgin Islands, through Dr. Pell's program, um, she could advise people on the brownfields that have already been identified in the, in the communities in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, somebody's asking here, what are some of the common redevelopment projects now this is really exciting because mm -hmm. there is no common redevelopment project. exactly they, are, they, run the, was, they run the game let's talk about that yeah it was basically favorites? it was basically needed in the community the most common one we say is um could be low income housing that is needed in the community it could be a senior citizen center um it could be a um not for profit use like a park it could be parking if there's need we need a parking right in my neighborhood so if it's parking that is needed if it's a school park it, the, it's basically endless this the, the possibility is 
always based on what's needed uh, on the community. And they can be very small projects. Yes. And also enormous projects. I remember one year uh, we went out to Atlanta for the National Brownfields Conference. Anyone who's listening, these conferences are the who's who of brownfields industry from across the territories and the U.S. And sometimes people from overseas come. We were in Atlanta and they took us to a, a section of Atlanta that had been a previous um, steel and iron works. And today it's thriving. It's it's like a little city uh, there in Atlanta and it's yes. all built on former brownfields. Whereas in a, a smaller community, you might see a, you know, a block residential uh, pro project go up on what was at brownfields in the past. And then obviously mm -hmm. some cities, they offer special incentives that make those properties even more affordable. They offer sometimes uh, mm -hmm. tax abatement programs. One of our colleagues is enjoying one of those. and. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of variety. It's basically what you believe your community needs and, yes. um, and what the market will help to, to support as well. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. Well, these are great questions, y'all. Keep those coming in. I um, know, they have good questions. Yeah. Sandra, let's talk a little bit more about the grant management. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the reports that are required under the grant that people need to be aware of and, and why those are important? Sure, yeah. As part of your terms and conditions, you know, typically they include requirements such as filling financial federal reports, MBEW um, reports specifically. Um, for the program side, you have to report, you have to submit the progress report. Normally, under the uh, Brownfields programs, you have quarter reports every quarter. Um, you have you always have to look, you know, your terms conditions to to check, you know, what are the frequency and the contents. And you have any questions, you know, you contact your project officer. Um, also, in the that's in the program side of you know reporting requirements. In the administrative side of the reporting requirements, you have the the federal financial report, which is this is a report annually reports the financial data, all the costs that you incur, you know within your project period. Um, so the, the term uh, of that, you need to submit inter, you know, interim financial reports. If you grant, if you have a grant for three years, as a sample, so every year uh, when your project period you know, ends, um, let's say it's September 30th, so you have 90 days to submit your interim financial report and at the end of the period, you need to submit the final every four. Um, for also annually, you are required to submit the MBE, WBE, which is this is the utilization, I'm sorry, on the federal grants. This is the minority. Uh, the famous MBE, WBE. Exactly, the famous, famous mm -hmm. MBE, WBE. Um, so this is a report, a uh, very important report that, you know, it's. It's a has grantees always have you know problems you know meeting this requirement. Um, but simply, this is basically due a uh, 30 days after your project period ends, and this is required when funds are budgeted for procuring procuring you know construction equipment services and supply. So if your budget have you know all those categories, then you report the amounts in the report. Okay. That report um, specific related to affirmative action, correct? Right. It's, 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 yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's if if you have in, you know if you have a contractor that is a certified you know minority, then you report that you know uh, the payment of that that invoice in your uh, in your annual report. However, the report is required even though there is no activity or procurement accomplishment. So you still need to submit that report annually with zero, you know, basically with not activity. So the question is also, but because people think that because they don't have any contractors that meet that criteria as a minority, they don't need to submit the report. They do have to, you know, submit the report, even though there's no activity at all. Um, so that in terms of reporting, I will say, you know, like, of course, from the program side, progress report, which is, you know, in Brownfields mostly is the quarter reports to a 30, year, 30 days after the end of the quarter. And in the financial and administrative side is the 
Federal Financial Report, which is annually, and the MBEWB reports. Okay, and super. anything else, you know, I, I always say, you know, you need to check your terms and conditions because any other report required is there. It's important when you get the award, you look and review everything and make sure, you know, that um, a, you can address, you know, any any requirements, specifically the report inside. And I always encourage, you know, the people, if you have any questions, you know, you can call, contact your credit officer or run a specialist. And certainly C. Clear can also assist in completing financial reports and also assistance in completing those maybe weebies. It's, right. um, well, it's, it's not so complicated, but it is important no. that it's done. And Yeah, and I'm glad you, you know, it's people and to follow up a question you was asked before about if you can get assistance outside to, you know, to for that type of management. It, what is important if you hire somebody which is outside of your organization, the information has to come from your in, in the in the in the case of the financial report, it has to come from the financial system. Okay. So you can always have somebody to you know give you a hand with the report, but the information has to come right from the organization. And then the signature on those reports also has to be what? It right. Has to be yeah. who, not the contractor. Well, whoever you establish in your organization in your delegation of authority, because right. absolutely, right. you know, a no, the, not the normally it's not the contractor. It's 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 or the president or the chairman or the secretary or the mayor. You know, somebody. You know, it's you know within the organization. Not it's the one uh, that signs the reports. The contractor will help you. You know, in the development, not uh, signing anything. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. So um, we have an interesting question here from the yeah. chat about the brownfields that have already been redeveloped in the Caribbean. Um, with assistance from the EPA. I can think of a couple instances. Um, we yeah. have the, the Fox Hotel, which is the former Plaza de las Delicias mm -hmm. in Ponce, a historic site um, that went through the Brownfields Phase One process and they were no recognized environmental conditions, which is a wonderful situation. It means you don't have to do cleanup necessarily. Yes. Um, and that project is now a running hotel since December of 2020. Uh, 2019, and we have a little video about it that we'll be showing at some point during the conference. What else? Yeah. Uh, we have a state donu, which was uh, is now a public housing project over in uh, Saint Croix, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was had a brownfields uh, money involved in it, and now it's public housing. Are there other examples you can think of? Yes, I remember, and this actually is from our targeted assessment program. We did a phase one and phase two for Cuomo. It was, I believe the project was an abandoned school and it's now the Alcaldia, it's now the, the mayor's office. I remember that project because they came on one of the weeks, one of the Brownfields week we, we have in, in Puerto Rico, I think it was two years ago, the mayor came and did a presentation on that project. I can also remember other sites in Jaucom and, and some other municipalities uh, because the good thing was that um, when we did the phase one and phase two, it was discovered that there was not a lot of contamination. In some cases, we only have to do that phase one and it didn't show any type of history of contamination on that property and that property was able to be uh, redeveloped right away. So those are kind of like the ones I remember right now. Yeah, honorable, honorable, honorable um, Garcia Padilla, the mayor of Cuomo, is going to be joining us tomorrow morning. Along oh, with okay, the, okay, the good. Of, um, the League of Puerto Rico Cities, and they're going to be speaking in the morning session for those who are here. It'll be bilingual. They'll be presenting in Spanish, but we'll have live simultaneous translation in English. They're going to be talking about the uh, placemaking that Cuomo did with some assistance from EPA funds as well um, to make the city really more friendly for the aging populations that we are all experiencing in the Caribbean. Uh, it's a beautiful um, set of projects and they're gonna be speaking to us about that tomorrow. Um, there's a question here in the chat related to the um, application process and they're wondering okay. if all grants go through the same competition. 
all the grants go to the same competition? Well, we have different competitions from year to year. Um, for example, the next competition will have assessment grants, uh, cleanup grants, and uh, revolving loan fund grants. And then the next year, we replace the revolving loan fund grants with the multi-purpose uh, grants. So um, for assessment grants, it's normally the ones that you apply to do evaluations um, in those property like phase one and phase two and, and use plans. And then um, the cleanup is to do the remediation on the property. And then the, the revolving loan funds is a program of uh, loans that um, the applicant is able to give loans to other eligible entities and you can apply for to a million dollar. Uh, for assessment, you can apply for $300,000. Uh, for the cleanup, you can apply for up to five hundred thousand uh, dollars, and it can include more than one property. And for the multi-purpose, when you can do cleanups and also assessment at the same time, you can apply for up to eight hundred thousand dollars. But they vary from year to year. Excellent. Um, we had a question uh, about the booklet that you had mentioned earlier yes. related to funding, and they wanted to know if that was also available in Spanish. Of course, it's available in Spanish. Uh, uh, we were very excited to create this booklet in Spanish, specifically for organizations in Puerto Rico that they don't have, um, some of them don't have the uh, specific knowledge on how our program works, the type of funding, the type of assistance we have. So we develop uh, this booklet with those type of organizations in mind. And of course we have to have it available for you guys in Spanish. So it is available and it's uh, um, right on in, in the booth right now. You can go ahead and download it. So for those of you who haven't found the booths yet, they're over there on the left side of the screen and or the left side of the screen depending on if i'm in a mirror view and uh, you look for the area that says exhibition or um uh, expositores in espanol um the the booklet uh, that i mentioned that cclear produced with uh, epa's assistant assistance um is available in spanish and english for the mm -hmm. funding guide to puerto rico and in just english for the u.s virgin islands yes and, and david um when i was talking about the type of grants that we have we also have job training grants um and these grants are to train residents and environmental uh jobs or so they could take advantage of all those jobs that are being created due to the redevelopment of these sites and you can apply for up to two hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars for those type of funds Mm -hmm. yes, I forgot I, to mention that. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the element that EPA has, this brownfield job development component, is so important. If you really yes. think about the communities that are living next door to brownfields, to have the economic activity created to redevelop that site and not have the local community participate mm -hmm. is um, addressed with this brownfields workforce um, grant. And so yes. it's a beautiful thing that EPA has offered. And um, it's obviously always great to see people um, participating and getting to work um, within their own communities and seeing potential elsewhere as well. Um, yes. Let's see, we've got uh, just a few more minutes here. You all can okay. keep sending those questions in. But um, there's a question here about the monetary contribution that organizations uh, mm -hmm. may have to contribute for any of these grants. Are there matching funds required for EPA's grants? Yes, so we have our um, cleanup grants and RLF grants and the multipurpose grants. All those three require what we call a co-share. For uh, the cleanup grants, you need a 20% co-share. And like I said before, you can apply for up to 500,000. For the RLF, you can you have to have a 20% co-share or also uh, included. And you can apply for up to $1 million. For the multi-purpose, you need a $40,000 co-share. But there's the case, like if you are a loan income, uh, if if the, the, the um, organization that is applying for is a lo has loan income residents and residents less than 
50,000 50, in the community, you can apply for a waiver. And you include this waiver as part of your application. All you need to have is a separate uh, letter uh, justifying why your organization cannot contribute that 20% um, cost share that is required. You can do that for our cleanup and for our uh, rewarding loan funds, but you cannot request a cost share for our multi-purpose. That is mandatory to have the, the $40,000 included. Okay, thank you for that. Oh, and um, a question here about the, oh, I lost the question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sandra, are there certain activities that you see that people try to include in the grants that shouldn't be included? Or you have to kind of go back and say, mm, can't, can't do that with these <laughs> Well, I think that they need to to always, you know, they have you have a budget, right? When in your application, um, you submit a budget, which is approved as part of your agreement, as long as you incur the cost, you know, for those of the categories that are budgeted, <laughs> you should be fine. Um, so, and, and specifically, you know, that budget mirrors the, the work plan. So anything related with the activities within the work plan will be an allowable cost as long as they are budgeted in the grant application. So to answer that question, you know, as long as you are the year, you know, you, you, you follow, you, you make sure that uh, the costs that you're incurring in the grants are budgeted in your grant agreement within the time period, you should be okay. Great. Mm -hmm. And you. also, David, just to add to what Sandra was saying, you cannot use our funds to pay for any penalty or for any fine that you receive. You cannot use our fund um, to comply to comply to comply with any federal law. You cannot use our fund for any type of lobbying activity or for fundraising. And you cannot use our funds for any type of co-share that is required for another federal grant. The only federal funds that are allowable to, you, to be used as, as a co-share are the CDVG funds. Thank you and for actually, that. yeah, and then, let me just add something else to mm -hmm. to that ask, You know, in terms of other costs, you know, you can always refer to uh, the regulation part two hundred, specifically the support E cost principle, which will tell you, you know, those you know those prohibited costs uh, on grants. So it's, it's a right in the statute, right there in the statute, right in, in the black statute, and white. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, in determining the allowability of costs, you know. There are certain items that are totally prohibited in, in you know, a, when you have a grant. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, um, it's been just delightful speaking with you both today and fielding these questions from our audience. Just before we uh, finish off the afternoon today, I want to remind people that tomorrow the conference continues. We begin at 10.30 a.m. sharp with an interesting conversation about uh, a case study in the city of Cuomo where they've done a place making initiative to make the city more friendly to people 65 and older. This session will be offered in Spanish and will have live English simultaneous translation for our friends in the US Virgin Island or for friends in Puerto Rico who want to hear that session in English. Additionally, tomorrow we'll also continue from 12 to two with lunchtime networking and visits to the exhibitor hall. So if you haven't visited those sessions yet, please do. Uh, there are great opportunities to meet other people literally face to face and in conversation within those areas. And I encourage you to take advantage of that. And then tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be uh, finishing the day at 2 to 3.30 with a session about rethinking community centers as hubs of resilience. Uh, this is a case study of resiliency hubs that were developed for communities in the municipality of Juanica in Puerto Rico. Uh, this was, these are projects that were mentioned in the article in El Nuevo Dia on Sunday uh, that were developed through the voluntary efforts of an organization called Resilient C Puerto Rico and the Voluntariado or
or the volunteers, uh, engineers, and architects who dedicated their resources to uh, resilience and revitalization project engineering. Uh, it's an incredible set of uh, considerations that they've included. I think it really extends our thoughts about resiliency hubs in the Caribbean, and I invite you all to participate in that session as well. It'll be offered in Spanish, again, with English subtitles simultaneous. Well, Jocasta, Sandra, a pleasure to see you. Continue Likewise. to enjoy the seminar, and thank, thank you very much for participating in today's session. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, David. So we are here all week. We are available at the booth. We are here to help you in any way that we can. Thank Great. you. Okay, so have a good afternoon. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.